Machine. Hello, it's Claire here and welcome to Hot Pod Time Machine. This is the podcast where we explore a decision from our past which changed the trajectory of our future. And we have a very special guest in this episode. It's one of my favourite people ever. It's oh. Mr. No 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 Wall. Hi. <laughs> Neil no, 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 your tongue jackknifed in your mouth. Neil Newborn, there he is. That was like the Arnold Schwarzenegger, thank you. That was like the Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, introduction. I'm Neil Newborn. You know what it is? I'm emoting. I don't know if you get this, Neil, when you're doing like, you know, recording like voice stuff, but as soon as I record the guitar or something, forget all the chords, everything like goes out of your head. I usually sometimes have a really. Often I have an idea which I think I think is a good idea, and sometimes it hits me so fast I get too excited and my my mouth just goes can't keep up with with the impulse. Yeah. So have that, <laughs> which is funny, but yeah. yeah. You have to be really. I think when you're doing this kind of job, and I see it on stage sometimes when I'm tired, I've, I look mm. I look at things back, and you have to be so conscious of the way your mouth moves. How you're yeah. projecting the, your tongue yeah. inside your mouth. You yeah. have to be so aware yeah. of it. It's... I just, I, I just like destroy basically honey and water, and then just, I just, oh, I always warm up whenever I'm. I basically, I speak a lot anyway, like normal life. So I, I have to warm up every day just because I talk a lot. <laughs> so, you, you speak a lot, Neil. It's I would... weird. I know it's a subtle thing, but if you, if you really look back at this interview, you'll. See, little signs that I talk a lot. But yeah. that's the great thing. Like the first time we met, and it was uh, like at Comic Con Birmingham. Yeah, like, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Twenty nineteen, and immediately I just thought, oh, I like you. You're just really <laughs> lovely and chatty and extroverted, and it makes my job ten million times easier because you've oh, got a you. lot to say. So I am. I've always. I'm, I have a, a very uh, strict policy about my private life details. However, mm-hmm. um, I'm quite relaxed talking to people. I like people. I'm interested in people. Um, I'm an extrovert, I guess, in, in many ways. I recharge around people. Does that make sense? Like introverts, I always think like recharge in solace. Like they're not alone or lonely per se, but they, they need that sort of like area around them just to go, okay. Whereas I find buoyancy and, and energy um, through meeting other people and having a good time with them, creating if I can, you know, if we're working together or, or just meeting them socially. Um, I get overload like everybody else. There's a limit to that. But um, I tend to get very buoyant and bouncy and all my energy flows very nicely when I'm with human beings. Oh, I Even like if I don't that. understand them very well. <laughs> I like that. It's nice. Though. We've talked about that before like because I've always yeah. said I think I'm more of like an introvert and extrovert's clothing, you know. And yeah, sure. I can totally yeah. do it. And and my job and your job, our jobs are very sociable, you know. Yeah, my dad's like that, actually. My dad is an introvert, but he's he's worn... I think he's worn the character of himself for such a long time. The only reason I talk about him in detail is because he's a, a public, he has a public job. Yep. So he's a um, otherwise I wouldn't talk about him, but because he's been around for a long time uh, in many different medias. Um, yeah, he's sort of, you know, he's got this persona of Gary Newborn that I think it's become hard for him to switch that off at home in some ways. He always, it's often as a kid, I remember him talking to me like it felt like I was being interviewed a little bit or, or rather he felt like he was telling me about this event even if it was just breakfast or something. <laughs> you know? like, oh. oh you know so we've uh, we've got toast um <laughs> you, you want to yeah we've got, we've got some good toast um I think there's jam too as well jam and toast you're like okay cool I don't know what to how to respond to that but thank you. <laughs> I feel like this kind of it sounds like my dad I feel like I like just... doing my dad. I do my dad's impression. I think I managed to, as a background character, get my dad's voice or my my interpretation of my dad's voice as a background character. So my dad doesn't know. <laughs> I don't think he'll ever know because he never watches things like this. Um, he'll know. He doesn't know, but I think he's actually a computer game character now. My dad's voice is great. That's I really so... enjoy it. <laughs> but then that's you know we we get our greatest creative inspirations from the people around us and the oh yeah the yeah. things that happen to us. You know. Um, you know, when I, I wanted to, you know, this this podcast is about decisions we make, and we're gonna. I know you're mm-hmm. gonna tell me it's a, and it's very much a creative thing, you know, that your mm-hmm. decision. But before we go into that, um, what was running through your mind, you know, when I asked you about this podcast, what kind of decisions were important to you in the past that you think changed your life? I think, um, I, I think to be mindful, conscious human being, you have to. You have to avoid the rose-tinted glasses thing of looking back at your life and only 
thinking of the good times and only thinking of the good things you've done. I, I also think you need to pivot and mark the, uh, the things that you maybe have learned from because they weren't good or, or they were a situation that you stumbled into or subconsciously or indirectly got yourself into by your actions and then you had to kind of get out of somehow or recreate your so I think um, uh, a lot of things kind of went through my mind. Uh, some stuff I'm not going to talk about, obviously, but some stuff I am. Um, and I, I think the, the obviously the obvious ones, like you know, the birth of my daughter, um, who I'm very protective over in terms of um, um, press and things like that. But I'm very public about the fact that I'm a dad. I'm very public about the fact that I adore her, and she's easily the best thing I've ever created, like by a, by a, by miles. Yeah, yeah. She's like the, the best thing I ever did. I, I don't advocate having a kid, by the way. Like, if somebody doesn't want to have a kid, do not have a child. <laughs> like, absolutely do not have a kid. Like, um, I, remember as a, I remember as a young man, that was also an interesting moment. You we were talking about pivotal moments in life. That also changed me. I remember, like, hanging out. I think it was with... I can't remember who it was we were with now. It was with, like, a young kid. And I had to look after them. I think it was, I think it was my cousin, actually. My cousin Peter, who sadly passed away last year. Mm. Um, and uh, I was looking after him. I was taking him around my grandmother's house. And we, we reenacted the whole of the Lord of the Rings from start to finish because he was a very bright kid and he'd read it. I, I was like 10 or something. He was like five or six or something. He'd already read Lord of the Rings, which is extraordinary. Wow. Um, I'd read it at eight. And I felt very intelligent reading it at eight, but he, was, he beat me. So he and I, and I, I was in, in charge of him because the, the, the adults were absent. So I took him around like the, the, the garden that my grandmother used to have. I remember thinking, like, I, I would like to be a dad. You know, I'd like to be able to look after somebody and give to somebody and without really understanding the full extent of what, <laughs> what being a parent means. But I remember having a very strong paternal instinct from that moment onwards. And I think, um, you know, my, one of my closest friends uh, kind of became a surrogate dad to me in a way. Uh, helped me through, like, teenage years into becoming a man. And I think there's something about the, the aspiration to give something to somebody that you know you may never get back yes. um but that is ultimately a good act that ultimately will enrich you if you do it the right way for the right reasons i guess which is simply to, to give and to help it'll make you feel good about yourself but also it, it's a, it's a good thing to uh, attention to the world especially if you can help inspire somebody towards a positive aspiration as a human being, yeah. you know? Um, I'm having to think about this quite a lot because I haven't really articulated that, but that's, yeah, I guess that's what it is really, is to, to be able to try and help, help our human existence, help the world, help yourself, you know, feel, I mean, here's the thing, you know, we do good things because it makes us feel good and that's completely legitimate. Absolutely. I think it's, it's a great thing to, to feel good about being a good human being in many ways. Yeah. I think the, the trap is that you should never expect it back. I think oh, yeah. that's the important thing. That's if you're generous, if you give out to people, you know, don't ever expect it back because then it kind of defeats the point of doing it in the first place, I think. That's what I think the greatest lesson I've learned at this old age now um, is that, because I love helping You say people. this old age, I think oh, I've got look, some mileage on you. <laughs> not that much. Uh, we're practically not, the maybe same. Maybe not that much, actually. Not yeah, we've much. discussed this. <laughs> probably, we're about the same age. Um, hitting, I'm hitting your decade very shortly. Let's yes, you are, love. Yeah, welcome. So, Thank, thank you need you. A you'll need a painting. <laughs> thank you. I am a painting. I, I have three thank up you. in the roof. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. I'll try not to look at it. Um, but yeah, like I, I feel like in my younger formative years, I had mm. a need to uh, look after people. But I, mm. there is was that expectancy of, oh, I've done that for you though, but I'm not getting very yeah. much back. You get very disappointed. Yeah. Now letting that go when you're older and just going, you know what it is, what it is, and letting the universe yeah. does it as it does. It's much more satisfying. You learn well, more about yourself that way as well. You do. And coupled with that, um, from my experience specifically, uh, I also got bullied a lot as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, I went through about Same. five years of just horrendous bullying. Yeah. And I learned a very valuable lesson at that point as well. Not just um, the a, you know, through bad things happen to good people of course they do because life is and, and most importantly life is not fair life is not structured to be fair no it is a big luck of the draw where you're born who you're born to the situation you're in as we've seen across the world many many times yeah. um and on top of that i think uh you know i created like a mantra for myself to get through that experience with some help you know with my good real friends uh was that life isn't fair but people can be fair if they choose to be and you should choose to be fair to have a good life 
So I think that's a big part, a big part of my frustration with the world and anger, I think sometimes I have, as, as we all do, is lack of fairness. Yes. Um, for humans, lack of fairness from human choice. Because mm -hmm. life itself is not fair. Life doesn't give a shit about you. Life is just coming on and you're just a part of it. You know, it's narcissistic to think that somehow you're entitled to something that the world fucking owes you. Of course it doesn't. No. It doesn't owe you anything. No. Um, but people can choose to be fair. And I think that's the frustration I have with human beings is when somebody could easily be fair and they're not, like, not, they're in a position to be fair and they still don't do it. It kind of sucks, you know? That's, that's, the, that's the annoying thing about human existence and choices, which is what this podcast is all about, our choices, our physical mm. choices, our mental choices. Um, you know, I think I struggle with that on a daily basis. Uh, I'm also a Libra. Okay, so I'm very indecisive. <laughs> You're a Libra. You're screwed. I'm screwed. I'm basically Do I take screwed. the blue jeans or the slightly less blue jeans? Ah. That's the thing. Like, it, with fashion, I'm like, I can't decide. But with work, I'm like, really decisive. I'm like, bang, and I'll make the decision. But love and yeah. fashion. <laughs> love and fashion. Libra. Love and fashion. <laughs> like, anything that's about nice stuff, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. And it's analysis paralysis. But we, yeah. we have the choice to be good, to be bad, to go down a dark path, or like whatever but you would call and it. Here's the other thing about that, though, right? Because we have these choices. However, they're mm -hmm. subjective, man. So, because mm -hmm. I, I deal with, I play a lot of quote unquote villains uh, as an actor, and I don't yes. see them as villains. I uh, don't judge my characters. That's for the audience to judge. Yeah. So, as a human being as well, we're subjected to morality that isn't necessarily aligned with our own. And it's very difficult sometimes to know, am I being bad by doing this? Am I a good person? Am I a bad person? Blah, blah, blah. And <clears throat> sometimes it's very clear cut mm -hmm. uh, to steal that you don't, what, something that you don't need, like emergency. Like if you're starving and you need food, yeah, I get that. That's fair enough. But, you know, to steal something for monetary item when you don't need it, when you could do something else to get it. Yeah, that's not cool. Mm -hmm. To murder somebody, to hurt somebody, to imprison somebody, to... You know, all kinds of horrible sexual things that people can do to one another. Yeah. Um, all those things. Yes, there is a clear line of what is right and wrong. Yes. But then there's also the gray area. Then there is also the, well, I wasn't, you know, you're not entirely aware of what you're doing necessarily. You don't, you're not being bad. You're just, you're just trying to get what you need. And actually through doing that, you're not being aware of other people. You're being sensitive. It gets very gray area territory, especially emotionally. And that's why we struggle. That's why we have all these difficulties amongst ourselves is because, our point of view and somebody else's point of view don't align. We have a problem and maybe we don't handle ourselves well. Maybe we're not taught how to do that properly. Maybe we don't have the facilities to do that. Yeah. Maybe it's a time thing, whatever the thing is. And I think that's the fundamental problem with the human race is that we have the capacity to solve all of our problems together, but we just can't seem to find the arena of discourse anymore. Yeah. Because um, it does happen, obviously. I'm not being glib and saying it never happens. Of course oh. it does. Um, you know, the best part of politics or diplomacy is that. But obviously there's many bad things to <laughs> politicians yeah, of course, and politics. Of course. Um, but it, it, the ability to have the conversation, the ability to have the discussion in a civil and fair manner, we are not good at that. We have not evolved that since the Greeks. No. And, and actually, I think the Greeks probably did it better, you know, with Plato. And, I mean, Socrates, of course, was stoned to death for not joining politics. But, you know, so. the idea of it <laughs> was pretty suck. advanced. Humans still suck. <laughs> Humans suck. Humans, Humans suck. We're so cool and so awful at the same time. And that's no. why we suck. We don't suck because we're so awful. We suck because we're so amazing and we're so awful exactly. simultaneously. Which, that's why we suck. As which a, makes as a the species. grey, which is the, the whole grey blob. Is, yeah, it's like we're, we're like we're complete assholes, or we're like we're awesome, amazing human beings. It's just, it's just like just pick one side, no, <laughs> like be oh clinging on, or I don't know, whatever. Oh. They have honor, I guess. So there you go. So speaking <laughs> about picking things, because I knew this would happen, because if yes. we we start we talk. talking, we talk, we blather yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Move, move on, move on. I know. Yeah. I'm, I want to ask you about. I've the... got press to do. I'm so sorry. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's a busy time. man, <laughs> listeners. He's a busy man. He spared us some time, you guys. Um, I wanted to ask you, Neil, because yes. uh, this decision that you made that changed your the whole trajectory of your future mm. and your present life what is it exactly i can show you actually i got a tattoo of it because it was so big yes. this is a, these are a, a representation of uh, mocap markers yes. this is actually my my shoulder that's been you know uh, the idea that it matches up and links up and creates a shoulder on me yeah. um it was performance capture performance capture changed everything about my life um i uh, before i started doing mocap and performance capture i was broke I was very close to being bankrupt. I was in an insane amount of debt. Um, and 
I managed to start finding, I also couldn't get a gig. It was very difficult. I was doing indie stuff and I was doing the occasional big TV thing or whatever. But it was always like playing the same roles. It was never stretching me as an actor. Um, I'd gone through a crisis in acting methodology already. I had a bad teacher for a while who just destroyed me. And then I found a great teacher. So I saw my love of acting came back. But that was after I started doing mocap. So <clears throat> mocap allowed me to be a character actor. It also allowed me to have a, a more, more decent paycheck. Even though the money then was really bad compared to what it is now, actually. But it was still something. Um, it also gave me a focus and a purpose as an actor and as a person. Uh, then I had a daughter. Uh, then I got divorced oh <laughs> pretty gosh. soon after. Um, and then uh, I was a single co-parenting parent, which I still am a single co-parenting parent. So, um, you know, it was, it was a trip, man. And the one thing that performance and mocap gave me with this abundance of work, because nobody wanted to do it, yeah. Um, was that it gave me this possibility to become financially buoyant, to look after my daughter, to schedule things around her, to be able to work intensively and then take a day or two off or something. So we have joint custody between myself and my ex-wife, uh, who's an amazing mum and uh, a great director as well. And um, that all came about. The reason I got to that place where I managed to become self-sufficient, buoyant, and, and actually really saved everything in my life, including being a good dad, and being able to look after my daughter with responsibility and, and, and financial stability to a point, at least like enough to be able to not have to uh, not you know buy food or something or not have a place to live or something like that. A lot of it was um, really because when I started doing mocap, I was still banging my head against the door of TV and film. And I was getting very frustrated and at times would be very distraught. And uh, sometimes I would say even not desperate to get the gig, but definitely nervous and apprehensive and overwhelmed at times mentally and emotionally about my prospects and about what I was doing and whether and ultimately whether I was a good actor or a terrible actor, all that kind of nonsense. Yeah. And having my daughter and then becoming very quickly uh, separated and then divorced from my ex, um, I had suddenly no safety net. I had, like, it literally was make or break. It was like, either you sort your shit out mm. or you are going to drown on this one. This is, this is bad. This is going to be years and years and years of major problems because you can't get your stuff together. And ultimately, you'd, you'd end up leaving acting. Uh, this is me talking to myself. Um, and I realized that, well, okay, let's step back. What is it that I'm doing that actually brings me money? And I was doing a lot of catering before that, so I didn't want to do catering yeah, <laughs> anymore. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, it was, yeah, it's a whole other story. Um, like many actors, you know, um, hold a, I hold a tray very well. Uh, so, <laughs> so I step back and go, well, hang on a second. I'm doing all this motion capture stuff. I get to play 10 characters in a session. I get to have loads of fun. I love the people I'm working with. There's very little kind of like internal politics. I can reach out to people uh, that are like I admire. I'm a gamer as well. So I admire the people I'm working with and the games I'm working on. And the studio, especially Audio Motion, Brian Mitchell and Stacey Boisel championed me for the first few years of my career. They were really single-handedly. That and Imaginarium as well. Um, I even worked at Centroid as well. I mean, but, but the really Imaginarium and Audio Motion championed me um, and helped me get this career. And I, I just realized, why am I killing myself? Why am I so upset about not getting these film roles and these TV roles that I go up for? And actually, I have no hope of getting when, you know, Orlando Bloom or Jonathan Reese Myers or or uh, Aidan Gillen walks past you like, oh, well, they're good. I'm, I look forward to seeing you in that role that yeah. I'm about to audition for. Yeah. You know, uh, I was getting so distraught. I was like, well, I can't, I haven't got capacity for that anymore. I've got a daughter and I've got a life I need to rebuild. So, so fuck it. I'm just not going to think about it because it's not important. And if it happens, it happens, it doesn't, it doesn't, whatever. I'm just going to have fun what I'm doing, but I'm just also going to now throw myself into this decision. I'm now going to go, right, this is working. This is what I'm doing. I love doing this. It's not even like it's a part-time thing where I have to do this. I absolutely love it. And I see the future where it's going and blah, blah, blah. I was like, well, I'm just going to do this. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to be grateful for it and happy for it. And I'm going to make it work. And so I was very good. I did my, I mean, there was nobody to teach in mocap at that point. There was no, no sort of like introduction to the industry. Like I just had to find a way of doing it myself. I researched loads of companies. I, I was thinking I was the first actor on LinkedIn probably. Because nobody was using LinkedIn back in 2010. You know, nobody used it no. apart from techs and devs. I think it was the only... <laughs> so it was like, an actor? Like, what is that? So I was contacting people. I was contacting people from, like, 
like people along the lines of like Brian, F um, people on the lines of like Interplay and those kind of people, like these people I've admired for years. I contacted some of the writers and directors, people like the equivalent of Spielberg in games. And I was getting emails back from them saying, wow, your work looks pretty cool. And, you know, I put together a mocap reel, which only like three people had a mocap reel at that point. There was only three of us that had reels to doing that work. Um, so it was like, you know, I had to, I had to just focus on that. And the second that I did that, the literally, and I literally to, I would say the week that I made this conscious decision mm. to go, right, I cannot control this. Therefore, don't worry about it. What can I control? What am I doing? What am I enjoying? What can I focus on positively and healthily? This, I'm just going to do this then right now yes. and not worry about the future and not worry about all this other stuff I've been chasing for years that isn't working out. I'm not worried about the self doubt. I'm not worried about the, what should have been, or I, had I not done this, then I wouldn't have done this and this wouldn't have happened and start following that negative chain of that one time I screwed up or said this thing to this per casting director or whatever the thing is, and actually just let it all go. And literally it's a choice. Um, and I know that because I experienced it. Yes. It is a literal choice, but you have to have a quiet moment. Yes. You I, have to have a quiet moment to do that. I completely, there's a lot, although our, our lives are quite different, I can, there's so many things that you are saying within mm. that, that I can completely empathize with. I think when, you know, when your life flips upside down, mm. uh, an emergency mode kicks into your brain, you do have to let go of a lot because you have to travel light. So you have to go, yep. right, I have to really mentally travel it. Like, and I, I did know. a lot of that last I year. Another, I have another tattoo, but it's pretty reverse. I don't know if you can see that. And that's, I guess no it, no, it says, <laughs> for those who are not, not watching the YouTube video, it says Nomad. So on your right <laughs> arm, that's your right arm. Um, but I'm, I feel a bit like that last year, I just went, everything just has to dissolve. Like it, It's extraordinary. I had to restart my life literally from scratch yeah. again with, with my daughter, obviously, with me. But I, I had to restart everything. I had to buy everything again. You know, I left the house where I lived. I had to find a new place, I had to find new furniture, and I mean, literally everything, including, you know, all that stuff. So, so for me, it was a complete restart, and it allowed me moments, because all I was doing was looking after my daughter and working. So it allowed me moments of quiet, which I hadn't had for a very long time. And in those quiet moments, being conscious of the quiet space that you have, as opposed to feeling oh, I'm lonely, or oh, I need to do this, I should be going out to see Pete friends and all that stuff, which of course you can do. Yeah. Instead, I was like, right, this is a quiet time. So let's just deal with what's in front of me. Let's not put it off. Let's not, not think about it. Let's actually sit with it happily, positively, and go, right, how am I going to do this? How is this working? How's it, what's going on? How, what can I do better? What can I do? What's going on realistically? And then, you know, and look at, and that takes also a, a big thing, which is to look at yourself honestly. Yes. Um, and that is a very difficult thing because you have to be, because you're going to be more brutal about yourself than anybody would ever be. Yes. But at the same time, you're also going to love yourself more than anybody else would, apart from maybe, if you're lucky, a parent. Yes. You know? Absolutely. So, yeah, if you have that, you know, which not everybody does, of course. Um, you know, and then at that point, you have to go, cool. What am I okay with? <laughs> what am I not okay with? It's also... What can I change? What can't I change? You know? I think it's that, I don't know how you feel, but like, without going too much into all my personal life stuff but I've sure. always had um a life where there's always been huge lows and changes and transformations from the age of when I was very very young I've had to deal with a lot of drama I deal with a lot of stress and deal with a lot of hard dark situations um so I've, I'm almost sort of used to it so when anything happens now I always know it'll be okay because life goes forward it doesn't stay the same Life's constantly changing. I, I, find, I find this idea that when people reach a certain age yeah. that they can't change aspects of, not everything, because they're not going to change the core of you, but yeah, you can, people say, oh, they're old, they, you know, they're not expected to change. It's like, why? Like, life changes. Why the hell shouldn't you change along with it? I mean, obviously, the core of you is not going to change, and that's fine, because that's, that's who you are. Yeah. But the essence around that, the sort of the trappings, the interactions, the way that you handle yourself, the way that you think about the world, all those things absolutely can change and they should change. Yes. Um, life is transient. Life is not standing still. And that's when problems arise, I think. When people don't adapt and change, improvise to some degree, overcome challenges. What happens is that people get into serious problems because they have this expectation of what life should be as opposed to what life actually is for them right now. And that doesn't mean it's going to be positive and joyous. It can be very, very hard and very difficult and awful. but that's what the great that's the great thing about human beings that's what actually our number one 
uh, trait as a race. Um, I only believe in one race, by the way. The term race is a horrible term. There's yeah. one race, it's human. There's ethnic backgrounds and nationalities and all that kind of cultures and stuff. There's Same. one fucking race, folks. Okay, it's human. So here's the thing. You know, our race as a whole are incredibly adaptable. We adapt. That is what human beings have always done. And I fundamentally believe our mentality and our emotional state can evolve and adapt with us. Oh, it's not just about con conquering the physical and conquering the environmental. We can also do that with us. But it, unfortunately, it does take a lot of work. And there's not always a, a great path. And there's not always even a destination. <laughs> it's just, it's just the, the journey of it, man. I call myself a nomad, A, because my life is pretty peripatetic. Uh, the anchor point is actually my kid. Um, but everything, if I didn't have her, I, I would be somewhere else in the world. I'd just be out there, you know. Um, but also, you know, it's, I'm a journeyman, you know, that's um, a journey. That's, that's how I design my life. It's a, it's a journey to, to wherever I end up, as we all do. But it's a conscious one, I think, is the point I'm trying to make. Everybody's on their journey. Of course they are. But I'm trying to lead my life consciously as far as I can. Absolutely. And that takes work. And I don't always get it right. And I often, you know, in my personal life, make mistakes and all kind of stuff. Of course I do. But it's a really interesting trip. Yes. <laughs> um, and I'm very lucky to have, be on a good path at the moment. You know, my, my path is really fun and great and very rewarding. Who's to say in 10 years it won't be? You know, I don't know. That's but I'll, a... be, I'll be there. I'll be present for it. You know? I mean, that one decision and that picking yourself. My life. I mean, picking yourself up and going, got to sort my shit out. Got to yeah. just keep going. I mean, learn how to sew. Oh <laughs> Got to oh, cook yeah. more than just like three meals. Got to <laughs> exactly. learn how to, you know. I was already, I was already changing nappies. I changed the very first nappy, and I was very good. I was very hands-on as a dad. I loved all that stuff. That's good. Um, it's really fun. But there was a lot of shit that I did not know how to do, um, and I realized I cannot be this sort of whirlwind twenty-year-old anymore because I'm not that age, and also I wasn't in the luxury of being able to have so much money I could just throw it at problems and never care about anything. Of course not. You know, it was just like, I, I can't get other people to do this. I had to do this. Um, the other thing I would say with that is the, once the realization of I have to do this, I also luckily had the wherewithal um, to engage with it happily, yes. with, a, with a light heart, with a, a joyous spirit, if you want. Because even just learning how to do domestic cleaning uh, properly, yes. <laughs> of which I was told many years, that's not how you do it properly. Anyway, properly, you know what I mean? Like doing it, just doing it regularly, I think yeah. is the thing. Yeah. Um, it was like there was joy in even the simplest tasks of making sure that, you know, my kid, when she's on all fours because she was a baby at the time, isn't going to stab herself with something I've left on the floor arbitrarily. Common sense you know, stuff. Or, or eat something, God forbid, you know, like medicine or something like that. Shit like that, right? Just to, to be on top of things. And it doesn't mean you have to control your life. It doesn't mean you have to not have fun or be wild or chaotic or whatever. It's not about that. It's about just the evolution of yourself. Yes. What can you do better? How can you improve your life? Because the other thing about being bullied mm -hmm. was that it gave me a mantra of life is not fair, but people can be, blah, blah, blah. The other thing that it taught me was that nobody is coming to save you. Um, and I remember that when I was, you know, in the situation where I had to restart a career, restart a life. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I embraced it. I went, nobody's coming to save me. And that's okay. That's totally fine. Yeah. That is not a problem. Mm. Um, because if I can do this, it just makes me stronger. It makes me more capable. Yeah. And it will make me happier, ultimately. And when I'm ready for help, I will ask for it. Absolutely. Yes. Of course, you should ask for it. <laughs> but get up yourself. Do you know what I mean? I'm exactly... Yeah. Oh my God, Neil, are you my twin? Are you my like? Are you my twin? Are you my army? Are <laughs> can we just become best friends? Like well, dude, we're Generation X, man. So, and Generation X is a funky generation because we were raised feral. Uh, we didn't have access to mental health. Uh, in fact, mental health was absolutely not a thing when we were kids. Oh no, nobody talked about that. You know, people always talk. people always tell. Uh, my parents always said, "Look after the house." Never. Are you going to be safe? It was more like make sure nothing happens to the house. <laughs> like, don't okay, burn I'll, it down. I'll be safe too. <laughs> so just don't you know, burn it. I was out. I was out on the weekends, like you know, doing the stuff I was doing, and it was more like just give us a number of where you think you're going to be. It was like it was. I never did, or the number I gave them would be completely useless yeah. by about two. I days. was like on my bike. I was. I was quite. Yeah, you're out, you know. um, again, I was quite nomadic as a child. You know, so I used yeah, to just too. like. Yeah. 
My mum would be like, where are you going? I'm like, I don't know. I'm gone. I'm going out. <laughs> out there. I'm just going. And I would be out for hours and hours. I just know to come back to eat, you know. So... <laughs> yeah, it was like, come back to eat. Don't burn down the house if we're not here. And look after yourself. We're not here. You know, everything is. That That's what like, I like. Yeah. I mean, I'm still the same. I, there's like no difference now because I'm like, the traveling, the traveling feeds me. You know, like I'm like, oh, like I like being yeah. out there in the world seeing sunsets you know being in strange bars on my own sometimes just people oh, watching yeah, yeah. and sure. God, yeah, I, sure. I love it i, mean, I, love I like people i like people but i, I get the, the quietest moments which i enjoy the most as well i'm traveling Same. where especially if i can't like i speak spanish like okay um i can understand the tiny bit of like bits and pieces of other language but not in conversation not nothing more than conversational yeah. but i don't speak anything particularly outside of spanish and english um so going to a place, I remember being in India, I was in India for three weeks with Yashraj Films, uh, screen testing for a film that ultimately got completely changed and my character was like aged up to 60s or 70s oh. and so the whole thing fell apart. But for three weeks it was really interesting because I was walking around where people did speak English mm -hmm. very, very well, but a lot, there, was, there were a lot of other languages there and a majority of the time, you know, you're, you're the person who's trying to understand what's going on. And you you feel very out of place because you're maybe the only white person there, mm -hmm. which is very healthy to experience something like that as well. Yeah. You know, it's very healthy to understand. Well, this is I don't understand. I've never experienced racism because I live in a country which is still predominantly white. Mm -hmm. But I can at least glimpse of oh wow! Imagine that plus prejudice plus bullying plus violence like that. That's mind blowing. Yeah. So you know, I, I, I've often talked to my friends who are from very multi ethnic background. A group of friends, very lucky like that to have people that have very interesting stories about their histories. Um, some British, some American, some all over the place, French and what have, as well. So that's sort of additional culture on top of um, their heritage as well. To 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 tell me honestly about their experience, yeah. and I think the the problem comes like with humans is that we have these moments to make choices to go on holiday not just to like a fucking resort but to actually go somewhere that takes a bit more effort yes. to meet people yes. that will change your life by simply going oh wow they think the same way as i do we're not so different after all <laughs> maybe any prejudice they did have or any fear specifically fear because that's what prejudice is ultimately any fear of this person that looks like this or whatever might go um, and it's a shame. Brexit, one of the worst things about Brexit, obviously, was losing the ability of those pivotal choices where people can just go, maybe start a whole new life, uh, just travel and work and meet people, and which would be a choice that maybe now they're not going to make. So we're talking about those defining moments in your life. And, you know, if anybody has a little bit of money, if they're lucky enough to have the ability to travel a little bit, travel, but don't go to a resort. Go out there, you know, yeah. find somewhere that's cheap, for sure. But then try and be amongst the people that live there. Don't just go to a, a resort yeah. and get everything delivered to you. You actually have to work for it. Like don't go it to Malaysia and eat McDonald's. I mean, if you want to do that, yeah, but eat the food. Maybe like one day if people love McDonald's, I'm not that's, really a fan. But, you know, it's fine if you want to do that, but try and eat the food. I always think food. Try and eat the food. Like, I, yeah, it's distressing, isn't it? I don't like foreign food. Then why the fuck are you visiting their country? Why are you there? <laughs> and the thing is, like, unlocking things like... I love um, foreign food. <laughs> like meal times and food is so simple, but you start to see how people, how the culture is by just... Food language yes. environment they all relate to each other yes. and then you of course you have spiritualism if that's the thing and then you also have cultural you know understand it all that stuff it all links in together it's not isolated to eat the food is to understand the language of the culture in some ways yeah because it kind of dictates you know elements of of how the people are oh my god 100 like when you think about spanish yeah. food i think vibrancy flavor yeah I think sure immediately when i think about japanese food certain malaysian food i've been to all of those places really formed and all that kind of stuff. yeah yeah so you, really you... structured and layered exactly you look at british food and you're like it's a little bland <laughs> it's a little it's a little grey, a little bland. We're lucky that we live in London, at least. I just love the fact that now you have British inventions like the Balti. Yeah. I dig that yeah. a lot. I come from Birmingham, mate. Yeah. So, so um, I grew up with a. It's a very. It's a British dish. It's not an Indian dish. It's based on an old Indian. I think it's North India. North India location. I can't remember exactly where, where the story is. But it was two brothers in Birmingham. They were they were Brummies. They were born in the seventies. They were like second, first generation. I think they were. And they created it. They, it's a British dish, Love it. you know? And, so there's yeah. hope for the Brits, yeah. There's, there's hope. hope. There's hope. There's hope. <laughs> Not uh, such bland food. <laughs> um, 
Neil, I, like, as always, I could probably speak to you from an, for another 35, yeah, 40 too. minutes. It's, yeah, no. it's ridiculous. Every time we get together, it's, it's just a big blather, basically. Yeah. Um, and I love it. Um, and this one's been a good podcast to do because you've not only talked about your choice, but we were just talking about the idea of change. Which I think is I'm going to add to that very quickly. Sure, so, yeah, yeah. The change that I consciously and was lucky enough to have the opportunity to take which I did with both hands and dive straight into it. And I managed to do a lot of great work and play all these characters and develop myself as an actor. It also allowed me the capacity, after about five years of doing hardcore mocap, I started mentoring people. Mm. Um, and it gave me the facility to make a choice to then take the goodwill and the love that I'd received, then put that out as well. So um, I run a non-profit, um, say non-profit, we all get paid day fees, but we don't, the company doesn't really make profit for the workshops we do. So that's why it's not a non-profit. We call it a non-profit course because we, we basically break even for the courses, but we pay all our crew properly, obviously. Sure. Um, but we run these courses for actors at a rate that they can afford by getting like one day of motion capture or performance capture as a way of saying it's not going to kill you financially. It's, you can tax deductible, and if you get one gig, you've paid for it. Yep. But we can now help you start your careers in the same way that I was helped by so many people in my career. And to have the choice to try and do that as much as possible um, is a really beautiful experience as a human being. I mean, listen, that's the workshops. I also try and help actors for nothing. I just help actors you know, try to get more work or contact more people. Or I think they've, they've, they're sort of like... There's even you know, occasionally people are screwing up a little bit and trying to help them with some advice, blah, blah, blah. No, you don't ever get that back. Like, you don't expect to get that back. It's more like, I'm going to help you because I received a lot of help, possibly more than I deserved at some times. Mm -hmm. And I took it, and it was so invaluable, it changed, helped me change my life. So I think the choice to be able to do that for other people, circling back to what we said at the beginning about being a, you know, a good person or doing good things or what have you, um, I think that's also a choice, you know, it's also, I think it's also a responsibility in that way. So to, to actively make the choice to change your life, to be able to give a lot back, because you've taken a lot, we've been given a lot, I should say, um, is also really important, especially the older you get. Oh, yeah. Um, because I think those, those are also defining moments in a person's life. Yeah. And they also shape you and mold you. And they have to be conscious as well. You can't, you, if you're going to help somebody, then help them. You know, just don't be seen to be helping them because it'll make you seem like a nice person. Actually do it. And, you know, I mean, I talk about the workshop stuff. I don't talk about the other stuff that I do for people because it's got nothing to do with anything. The workshop stuff, you know, we're trying to get people involved, so I'm quite public about. But there's many other things that we do, you know, in our company to try and help people that we're not going to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important that people understand that, that if you receive a lot, if you're lucky enough to get a lot back, then you should absolutely make it part of your life mission to then help other people. I think you so. absolutely should. I and that's so. not, you know, no judgment to people that don't want to do that. But I, I fundamentally believe that's how the world, of, you know? Yeah, I absolutely agree. God, Neil, someone cutting onions up in here. Jesus. Neil, it was very emotional. <laughs> very emotional. <laughs> I can, be I can be brutal now and say I gotta go. Before you go, uh, please tell us where can we find you online, Neil? Where can we find uh, you? So I do a fun Twitch thing, which is like a comedy show. It's very amateurish. I'm not really a Twitch person in that way, but we do a comedy show, which is on Twitch, which is twitch.tv forward slash Neil Newborn. Um, I got my social media is all Neil Newborn, basically. And uh, we're also, we've got a fun role play game that we do. We're starting back up again called the Vagabond Chronicles. That's going to be on Twitch. Ooh. I've also got a whole bunch of games coming out this year, about three major games. Uh, the next one is on 2nd of February, which is like two days time, I guess. So this will be in uh, the past. So you will be able to get it oh, when this podcast is oh, out. So this is future Neil telling past you. <laughs> and I, this is past Neil telling future you. Yes. Uh, the game that just launched, I have no idea what the reviews are, so maybe, it was, maybe it's not good. I don't know. Uh, it's called Deliver Us Mars. Uh, check it out. And also, Baldur's Gate 3 comes out in supposedly August, which I'm working frantically doing my bit to try and help that. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so... Um, and I might be doing like a whole bunch of conventions. I don't know. I, I'm around. I'm around. Please yeah. go check Neil out. Neil, uh, thank you so much for this. Um, thank you for asking. It's lovely to see you again, Claire. Well. No problem. This has been Hot Pod Time Machine. Uh, we will catch you again next time. Take care. We do a dissolve, 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 dissolve. Hot Pod Time Machine.